All right, thank you, Mark, and thank you to Samak for the opportunity to update everyone on our Elizabeth Creek project. Um, we'll get through all the critical stuff first. I'm not really a corporate guy, so I'll uh, leave this for others and get straight on to the summary. Uh, we put this up the front so that in case my scintillating talk can't keep everyone's attention, at least you'll get the key points and then after a few minutes you can settle back and relax. And those key points are uh, Elizabeth Creek is a principally sediment hosted copper cobalt project here in South Australia. We've got about 1.1 million tonnes of copper equivalent in resource. And once we get the thing up and running, or until the uh, plan is to have it producing about 25 kilotons per annum of copper and about a kiloton per annum of cobalt. Uh, so we are located right here in South Australia and we do get the benefit of being in a, in a true tier one jurisdiction, uh, particularly the ESG benefits that come with being here, which is uh, very important if you plan on producing cobalt and uh, the benefits of what my CEO insists should be called a simple approvals process, I think mainly because he doesn't have to be the one going through it. Um, I prefer to think of it as a predictable approvals process. We know exactly what we need to do to get from where we are now to where we want to be. Um, and the other thing I will highlight on this summary slide is the last point there, the uh, untapped exploration potential. Every junior will tell you they have untapped exploration potential. We're no different. The uh, only slight difference is that I actually think in our case it is very true. Um, a lot of people might know CODA from our IOCG hits over the last couple of years at MEIOCG. And we do think that there's still quite a bit of potential in that deposit, that deposit type, and we're still very engaged with it. But there's also a lot of scope to grow the sediment host material, and uh, I'll be speaking to that in a little bit. So we're in the advanced exploration day today, and we are at scoping study level. We put this out in March, and we are, well, based on all the work we've done to date, and if you'll allow me a bit of editorializing, I do think that Elizabeth Creek is set up to be a mine one day, and hopefully one day relatively soon. Uh, based on our, our first pass scoping study, we think we've got about half a billion dollars worth of NPV bid over at 26.5% IRR with a uh, $2.19 per pound of copper AISC, which if you assume today's uh, cost curve, that would put us pretty solidly right bang in the middle. Uh, the objective is to produce a bit over 300,000 tonnes of copper over the lifetime and just short of 15,000 tonnes of cobalt. And I should say that is copper cathode and battery grade cobalt sulphate, along with some significant uh, zinc and silver byproduct credits. So we want to capture that value add and do it locally right here in SA. Um, so yeah, that's the, uh, that's the three minute summary. So now you've got all the key details and you can uh, phase out if you want, but you will miss out on me using our snazzy new 3D system that I've been told to use, but uh, you may have to bear with me as it is my first time doing it. Hey, it worked, excellent. So where are we? We are in, well, just outside of Woomera right in copper country. So we're about 15, 16 k south of Oak Dam West, about 40 k's west of Cara, and uh, just about an hour south of Olympic Dam. It takes about six, seven hours to get up there, generally dependent mainly on roadworks. And uh, being where we are, has it does come with quite a few advantages. Obviously, infrastructure is a big one, the sealed road, the rail, the power, it all runs straight through Elizabeth Creek. But there's also just being in the heart of mining country, it just makes things easier. Earthworks companies are up there, water carts, all that sort of thing. Land access and even the TOs, everyone knows about mining, they know the advantages it can bring and it makes it easier. And I should take this opportunity to acknowledge the Cougata people who are the traditional owners of the land which forms the Elizabeth Creek project. Uh, so I'll just quickly take everyone through our three resources for our uh, Tapley hosted copper cobalt. Starting here in the south with MG14, it is our smallest deposit at just about 2 million tonnes, but it's also our shallowest deposit. And while none of our Tapley hosted deposits at uh, Elizabeth Creek have the world's most forgiving metallurgy, it does float up fairly well. So we're taking it as a bit of a starter pit. The first thing we'll, oh, hey, there we go. Like I said, first time. 
Um, we'll be hopefully be able to mine out MG14 very early on and run it through our float plant while we're still digging our underground declines, our other deposits, and while we are working on our hydromet. So that'll give us hopefully some early revenue and some. This is not going well. Um, uh, knock off some of the risk a little bit of some of the capex and startup costs. Moving on, we go to wind about. And actually, before I move any further, I'll just take this opportunity. That white line that you see there running between the two deposits is the Carapatina Western Access Road, which is brand new, fantastic, well-built road. And we do have an agreement in place to access that road once uh, development kicks off. So again, infrastructure-wise, you really couldn't ask for a better spot to be working. Um, wind about. So it's a bit bigger than MG14, but it's also a bit deeper. And as a result, largely of that depth, we have to uh, make some decisions about what we prioritize. So you can see here we've split the resource up into four separate pits as opposed to one large pit. It's largely a result of a, of a relatively conservative copper price assumption compared with some of the forecasts that people have been putting out for when we expect to be mining this. It wouldn't take much of a bump to turn these four pits into one big pit and increase that uh, extraction percentage quite significantly. But for now, we're just assuming we're gonna pull the eyes out of it and uh, focus on the highest return tons. Um, moving on from the uh, open pits, we'll move up to Emmy Bluff, which is our largest deposit and a bit off on its own on the northern boundary of the tenure up here. So you can see Emmy Bluff is quite a bit bigger at about 43 million tons and quite a bit deeper. So we will be going underground for Emmy Bluff. Now we've spent quite a bit of time figuring out exactly how best to tackle it in terms of underground mining. And we've come up with a 15 year mine plan that from, uh, from go to woe, from first cut to final retreat tons that will see us producing about 26 million tons at about 1.8, 1.9% copper equivalent. Now that's only about 60% of the resource, and I'd like to see that number grow during PFS. So we're looking at various different technologies to help us increase that um, paste fill, backfill, that sort of thing, but also mechanical cutting, which I had really hoped to have finished and able to present today, but that hasn't unfortunately happened for various reasons. So all I can say is keep an eye on our announcements, hopefully in the next few weeks, we'll have something out with nice shiny new numbers on extraction percentage and mining costs. Um, oh, right, yes, this slide. Um, the story behind this slide, if you can imagine the uh, combined frustration of a mining explorer CEO just being compressed down into a single slide, this is what it would look like. Because what tends to happen with Emmy Bluff is you explain to people it's flat-lying deposit 400 meters down between two and six meters thick, and they will look at that and very confidently turn to you and say, ah, it's too deep, it's too skinny, you can't mine it. The reality, of course, is very different. We've had this mining plan go through multiple mining engineering firms. It's been reviewed over and over again. And the, the simple fact is that Emmy Bluff, by global standards, is pretty standard. Um, these sort of deposits, these deep and thin deposits, are the heart and soul of the mining industry in Poland. They're very common in Africa. They're known from Asia, North America. And it can essentially be mined with very conventional, very standard techniques and equipment that we'll be able to more or less walk in on day one and have the confidence that we'll be able to do it. Um, yeah, sorry, that's, uh, that's a little bit of a rant that goes in there. But, uh, you know, you uh, hear the same facile complaints over and over again, eventually you have to get a preemptive strike going. Um, but now we're getting to something a bit more fun, which is exploration. I did tell you we had some potential there, and we do. So I am a geo, and I would like nothing more than to spend the next hour or so with uh, Leapfrog up there showing everyone all the uh, potential to expand it. But I've been told that's bad form when you've only been given 15 minutes to talk. So I'll try and focus on uh, a few of the more interesting key elements. What we're looking at here is a uh, seismic velocity model uh, cut through at about 400 meters. So the depth of the uh, Emmy Bluff deposit and filtered to above 2650. So essentially the high velocity, high density rocks, uh, which we collected with ANT about a year ago. And you can see it's done a reasonable job here in isolating the uh, Emmy Bluff deposit itself. 
but with quite a few uh, other bits and pieces out there. And, uh, and uh, to avoid false positives, we've correlated it against other known, other geophysical methods that we've done out there, and we've done quite a few. You can see these yellow outlines here are, um, I've got to stop touching this lectern, it is uh, very delicate, are uh, where the ANT crosses over with other things like 2D seismic, like MT, or in a few cases, uh, historical drilling. And those are areas of, of focus for us going forward. But these pink outlines are also very interesting. These were the result of a package of work that we had done by Mirror Geoscience, principally focused on IOCG, with the objective being to synthesize all of our geophysical databases into something that we could use to generate the geological model. And as part of that work, they developed a basement model, the contact between the Pandara and the underlying Wallaroo, which is below where we are here. They identified that there is a strong correlation between basement lows and known Tapley. And then they, independent of pretty much anything else, came up with these two pink outlines as areas where there are basement lows but no drilling, suggesting the potential for more of our host Tapley Hill rock down there. Importantly, overlapping with ANT and other anomalies. So again, we're very keen to get down there and test these. Um, it's something we're going to be focusing on in the new year. Now, I've been threatening you with IOCG this whole time, and that's what we'll uh, get on to next. MEIOCG is located just off to the west and below ME Bluff. It's about 400 meters further down. And at this point, we don't have a resource down there. What we do have is a pretty significant number of high quality intersects. And you can see some of the, uh, some of the better ones here. Uh, the grades, I think, pretty good. You know, uh, 27 meters at 2% almost. There's some 3.6% dirt, uh, you know, 36 meters at 1.05. These are intersects with, in terms of grade, which can stand up against any uh, of the Gaulacraton IOCGs in our area and beyond. The, uh, the difference is we don't have the thicknesses. Uh, and the question that we've had all along is why don't we have the thicknesses? And as the result of the mirror work, we think we figured that out. Essentially, while we are very confident that MEIOCG formed as part of the 1590 Olympic event from that fluid, we don't think that it formed in the same sort of classic way because we don't have the classic breccia pipe. What we've got are these long tabular ore bodies that we don't really see in the other major IOCGs. What the, uh, the mirror guys ultimately came up with, comparing 2D seismic and MT and a lot of our, our work, they identified these two uh, structures. And I say structures because we're not 100% sure whether they're faults or whether they're more related to half grabens, and these are just bedding planes on the, on the tilted half grabens. But they seem to almost certainly be conduits for fluid moving up from the basement. A first pulse of fluid, probably more iron rich, then these were sealed by tectonic movement of a granite thrust sheet coming through, but not before they dropped off quite a bit of iron, resulting in this that we've modeled here as the density anomaly associated with both the faults and the, or the structures and the mineralization. Later pulses, according to our current model, would come up, be unable to penetrate the aquitard that had been pushed in, but didn't have the pressure to brecciate. And whether that's because of the presence of Oak Dam West as a potential sort of regional scale pressure valve, or for some other reason, we, we still don't know. What they did instead was to spread through the Wallaroo Group sediments, the sort of preferentially permeable strata, dissolving existing material and dropping off copper and gold, which essentially gives you an exploration model that is focused on three different factors. Proximity to these structures, proximity to the density, and the density anomaly that we've modeled, and being within or close to those stratiform uh, features, essentially the strata that were preferentially permeable. When you put all that into a model, you get these uh, yellow shapes with holes cut out of them, essentially, where there's been erosion based on our, uh, our basement model. Now, we've assumed that there is potential here to push that at least two and a half kilometers north, and that's based on the presence over here of a couple of historical holes. I had two and I had five, which are just north of our boundary, but which do have um, IOCG mineralization in them, 
So we, uh, we take that to mean that we can, in fact, move at least that far north and still be within the system. But we've made no assumption about how far south we can move. And effectively, the mineralization system here is, is not capped to the south. Um, so we're pretty excited about this. We've got exploration models now for both our sediment-hosted material and scope to expand that, and for our IOCG and scope to expand that. Obviously, this is quite deep. It's expensive drilling. We're actively looking for a partner to help us fund and progress this. But um, what I'm really hoping is that this time next year, we'll be able to stand here and uh, say not only were we uh, right about our ISCG hypothesis and we're drilling out the next uh, great Gawler deposit, but uh, that we also have the, uh, the economic project a little higher up that will allow us to uh, move forward with something that we can uh, call a copper mine. So uh, that's a very, very quick summary of what is quite a bit of work over the last 12 months. Uh, there's plenty of code of people floating around. If anyone wants to uh, hit us up afterwards, we'll be happy to uh, talk your ear off about uh, Elizabeth Creek. So thank you very much.